Amen. To God be praise. To God be praise. We just want to thank our music ministry for blessing us this morning, this afternoon. And what a blessing it has been. Thank God for those who are part of the corner, as well as our musicians. And thank God for our ushers who greeted us and made us feel like this is the place to be. And then we just want to thank our ministers and our diagonal and certainly our elders for blessing us with a prepared place that we may come to seek the Lord, that we know he will be found and that he lives within us. What a wonderful time of year. This is a great day. Come on now. Somebody ought to give God a big hand. It's a day like no other day in the entire year. Christmas is fine, but there's nothing like the Resurrection Sunday. Oh, the mighty thing that God did for you and for me. I'd like to ask that you would join me at uh, the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, John uh, chapter 21. And I want you to cast your eyes along with mine and let us take a look at the 15th through the 23rd verse. John chapter 21. John's the last of the gospel. In the New Testament is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 21. Verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my sheep. He said to him again, second time, Simon, Son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, the son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you, even where you do not wish to go. This he spoke, signifying what death he would suffer to the glory of God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast in the upper room, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren, that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? 
I'd like to lift as a topic to go with this text and for your thinking, a subject to go with this scripture and for this sermon. No question about it. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you will bless your word and hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Bless your word, dear Lord, that it will be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Bless your word, Lord. Send it forth, and please do not allow it to return unto you void, but do that which you've called it to do. Bless your word, Lord, that we will not just be hearers of it, but doers of it. Bless your word, Lord, and we'll come to understand it as the words of eternal life. For the grass will wither and the flower will fade, but the word of God shall stand forever. Bless your word, Lord. That your word will become our words, and our words will become your word. So let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Speak, Lord. Thy servant heareth. Speak, Lord. Thy people heareth. In the name of Jesus, we ask it all. And God's people said, Amen. This is a very critical moment in these post-resurrection days of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What we have discovered in this particular 21st chapter of John's Gospel, that this is the third time that Jesus has appeared before his disciples. If we look back over these chapters of John, we would discover that there were two other times. One where there was the presence of uh, Thomas and one where there was not the presence of Thomas. Thomas, as you know, has been dubbed the one who is the doubter. He's the one who has questions. And I would dare to say to you that the truth of the matter is that they all had some questions. They were a group that was constantly asking questions. Uh, they were ones who were somewhat concerned about this mystique called Jesus. They started out with questions. Their first question was when they saw him is indeed, where do you live? They, they wanted to know a little bit more about him. Some had been disciples of John the Baptist. And they were getting ready to move over to follow Jesus. As John had indicated that he was going to begin to desist. And certainly was not worthy to tie the very shoestrings of Jesus. But in the process of all that they had heard about him, they were concerned about who he happened to be. And they were raising that question. Where do you live? Where do you dwell? Who are you? But I want to suggest to you that that was the question after the question. For the first question that was raised was raised by Jesus himself. No matter how puzzling life might be for us, no matter how difficult life might be for us, the Lord is always the initiator of the questions in our lives. He's the one that really begins to help us look at where we're going and how we've got to certainly tread through these particular mazes of life. He's the, he's the one who causes us to really think about what's going on. He's the one who helps us in our uncertainties. He's the one that blesses us to be able to handle the things that seem to be difficult to handle. Well, Pastor, what was the question that Jesus asked? Jesus, in that first chapter of John's Gospel, asked them, his disciples, what do you want? But sometimes you've got to come to understand what it is that you want in life, all right, all right. what it is that you are dealing with in life. And what you've got to do in order to help yourself with the issues. Because the truth of the matter is that we all have some questions about life. 
And these disciples were nonetheless the same. Uh, they struggled with the issues of how they were going to be able to make it. When they could not begin to feed the masses, Jesus had to be able to say to him and to them that you can feed the masses. And that you can call on me to be able to help you to feed the masses. Well, pastor, help me a little bit more. Well, it's amazing that in a crowd of four to 5,000, there was one boy that had a basket. We call it the five loaves and two fishes. In other words, when you've come to the problems of your life, I want you to know that even your hunger can be satisfied with a God who said, I will supply your every need according to my riches and glory. I, I know that there are times when we just can't handle illness and sometimes in the midst of how good we might be or in the midst of how much we might pray. Can I visit with you and take you down to the bottom of a mountain where a man came with a sick child and yet in the midst of their praying, they still not able to help this young man become alive and well again. And what did Jesus say? This kind, sometimes you got to put your weight on it. This kind comes by prayer and fasting. It's all right. I, I know you struggle with your prayers, but sometimes you got to add a little bit more to your prayer life. You got to turn the plate over. You got to back away. You've got to begin to not depend on yourself which food helps you to do, you've got to realize that you've got to depend on God and God alone. Or they ran into some troubles. They had their difficulties. And I believe that what the Lord was able to show them in this critical moment, even as lies floated around the city of Jerusalem, and how rumors began to say that he did not, his disciples took him. And in the midst of all of that, they had to realize that Jesus still was a great and mighty God. Pastor, help me out just a little bit more because I really want you to understand that when you stop and really think about it, there should be a place and time in your life when you can say, no question about it. Your, your, your faith is so strong and so, so, so much in part of you that you don't even concern yourself about the questions that you want to ask or really need to ask. You, you rest assured that even though it might be dark today, tomorrow the light will shine. Even though you're going through a turbulent morning, uh, evening hour, you're going to rest assured that weeping may endure indeed through the night, but yet joy will come in the morning. You, you're resting assured that maybe I don't know all the way that I might have to make it, but somehow the Lord knows how to make a way for me. Can I tell you like mama would say, don't worry about it, son. The Lord will. Make a way? Somehow. In other words, your faith has got to be such a strong faith that sometimes even when the clouds are there, you can say with great humor, but there is a sun beyond the clouds. There is indeed a silver lining. How do you know it? Well, I believe that the Lord has to challenge us to come to grips with what we are dealing with. And in this particular story, we find that the Lord says to him, to the disciples, follow me. Come, Peter, just follow me. Then he comes back and says to him, you follow me. Can I make it a little bit more specific? Because the struggle is Peter's. And, and Peter has been one who has held really strong to the fact that I am your boy. I, I, I'm your sidekick. I'm, I'm the one who is going to be with you. But every now and again, we are questioning why we do what we do. It's not so much that somebody is going to deal with what you do. You've got to understand that what really happens, people want to know why you do what you do. It's, it's a little bit more than just doing things. It's really coming to grips with why you do what you do. And here it is that Peter uh, takes and want to go back. And it says in this particular 21st chapter, that Peter said to the gang, to the brothers, to, the, to his fellow cohorts, we need to go fishing. They respond to him rather, we need to join you. His mind was made back to go to his comfort zone. He wasn't sure what, what the next day would be. Wasn't sure about how this resurrection story would end up. Wasn't sure about which way they were going to go. 
And so he went back to what he was familiar with. Has any of us ever gone back to what we're familiar with? Have we ever gone back to our comfort zones? Have we ever gotten to the point where I go and where I know there is security in my life? And sometimes what we've got to understand is that the Lord does not want you to go back to where you've been, but to go forward to where he wants to take you. What are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying to you is that as Peter was looking at going back to fishing, the Lord had to show him how to really fish. And so he yells from the shore and shouts to the disciples in the boat and said, Have you caught anything? And they yelled back and said, We've caught nothing. And, and then he says, Well, take your nets and throw it on to the other side. Drop it and see what you can get. And as they did, they discovered that they had 153 fish. Can I pause right there? I don't know about you. I've been fishing, and sometimes all I ever caught was a cold. <laughs> but in the midst of what they did, they had to understand two things about what the Lord was dealing, dealing with. One was that he was showing them that I don't want you to stay just in Jerusalem. I don't want you to stay just in Palestine. I don't want you to just to be concerned about Israel. But symbolically, the fish that you are catching, the 153, Jerome, that churchman of ancient day, said that it represented all of the fish in the sea. Well, if that be the case, then what he was saying also is that the 153 was all the nations in the world. And we can hear that and understand that as the Lord in the 28th chapter and the 19th and 20th verse of Matthew tells us that the commission is that I want you to do this. I want you to go to all the nations. I want you to baptize. I want you to be able to teach them what I've taught you. For the truth of the matter is I want you to make disciples. And you have to be able to know that I will take care of you. I will help you to be able to teach those who are in foreign lands. I will be able to show you. But you still got to deal with the why you're going to do what you're going to do. And so he, he gets Peter right there where he wants him. In the midst of the comfort level that he's been known to. He even tells him, come on back with the ship onto the shore. And I, and I want you to break bread with me. Now I wondered about this because Jesus didn't go out on the ship. Jesus didn't go out walls with the nets in his hand, but yet Jesus had fish and bread on the, on the stove, if you will, waiting for them to come back. In other words, I sent you not to be fishers of fish. I'm sending you to be fishers of men. And I've got to show you that I already have it mapped out for you. You see, sometimes what we've got to deal with, we've got to stop getting all caught up in the the morose of our situation, and realize that the Lord has already got it fixed for us even before we get there. I don't know about the fish that they had in the nets, but I got a feeling the fish that Jesus fixed on the shore was better than anything that they could find in the nets. Y'all put a pin on that. Maybe you'll catch up what I'm trying to say by the time you get to the parking lot. But what was the why? Because we all got to deal with questions. And here it is, here it is, here it is. Uh, what, what the Lord had to say to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know I love you. Well, feed my lambs. Watch out now. Peter, do you love me? And by this time, Peter is getting disgusted, upset, like sometimes we do when we don't get the answer that we want. And so what the Lord had to do is tell Peter, do you really love me? Are you sure about your love for me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. But here is why he says this to him. He said it to him so that he could understand how much he loved Peter. Peter, do you love me? As I love you. And I bet, I guarantee, I believe 
that what Peter had to do is to go back to that moment when he denied him. Look at the threes. Look at the question of the threes. And three times the cock crowed. Sometimes what you've got to understand is that the Lord doesn't want you to go back where you've been to the sins of your life, to the things that you did wrong, but to realize how much he loved you and take it and go forward. Peter, do you love me? And every now and again in the midst of our questions, sometimes in the midst of our hardships, we've got to realize that the Lord has said, I love you. No matter what you're going through, I love you. And to prove that I love you, I've died on the cross for you. To show you how much I love you, I rose up from the dead for you. To show you what I feel for you, I love you so much that you can't even compare to my love for you. But he tells him, follow me. And the thing about it is that I want to raise it with a question for you. Are you following him? Have you come to the point where there's no question about it? Have you come to the place in your life where you're sure about what you're doing? When you know that the Lord loves you, the question is, how much do you love the Lord? First of all, I I don't understand one thing about how Peter is there with the Lord. And the Lord is speaking to Peter and he says, follow me. That's the first time he says, follow me to Peter. He says this to Peter because Peter is getting an invitation. And every day the Lord allows us to live, we are getting an invitation to follow the Christ. The Lord is saying to us, I want you to follow me because I love you. I want you to know me and I want you to get to the point where you love me. The disciple is always somebody who wants to learn. A disciple is somebody who wants to know. And Peter in a marvelous passage of scripture tells us about that as a benediction, if you will. Over there in that fifth chapter, excuse me, I'm sorry, over there in the... uh, uh, third chapter of, of First Peter, that he tells them in a form of a, of a benediction that you are to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that you can really be a disciple is that you've got to really appreciate the invitation. You've got to not only appreciate the invitation, you've got to grow in the process of being a good disciple. He tries to help him to understand that you don't have to ever get to the point where you can't handle what goes on in life. When you've come to the place in your life where you realize that the Lord has trained you and grown you up, they're going to face some difficult times in their lives, but they had to be disciples who were able to face the issues of others who did not know. You've got to realize that there are times where you've got to be sure about what you believe. Because your mom and your dad, maybe your brothers and your sisters, your spouses may not have the same idea you have. You've got to be able to be able to hold on to your faith in spite of somebody else that you work with who may not be a Christian like yourself. You've got to understand that your neighborhood, you might have neighbors that don't know the Lord at all. You've got to be able to know him for yourself. You can't just hold on to what mama said and what daddy said. You've got to be able to say, I know the Lord for my very self. You've got to get to the point, no matter whatever goes on in your life, that no matter what hurts, what hurts, what's going on, you can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, I have no doubt in my mind about what the Lord is saying to me, and I'm going to be all right in the midst of my storm. You ought to be able to say, as Peter would say later on in that same first letter, I'm going to cast my cares on the Lord because he cares for me. Sometimes you're not always sure, but a good disciple is going to be to a place where no questions about it. He's sure about what he's sure of. The other thing about it is sometimes you've got to deal with instructions. And the second time that Peter hears Jesus talk about, follow me, the law is clear about it. He's emphatic. He speaks imperatively, and he says, you follow me. No, I'm not dealing with John. I'm dealing with you. Peter gets to the point like some of us. We're concerned about what somebody else is doing. 
But the Lord is saying to Peter, you. I'm not talking about any other church. I'm not talking about any other disciple. You. I, I'm not talking about what somebody else is doing. I'm talking about you. Now, what's Peter's problem? Peter looks around and doesn't even call John by his name because John's name is never mentioned in his gospel. But looks around and sees what's happening with John because the Lord said that John may, perhaps, not taste death, may be around a long time. But he didn't say that completely. What Peter got concerned about is maybe John was going to get the edge on him. Peter had already been known as being the first. Peter had always been known to being the one who is vocal. Peter had always known as the one who leads. But just because the Lord made a reference to the eternal life of John, Peter got concerned. Sometimes we get concerned about somebody else and what they are doing rather than understanding what we need to do. The Lord didn't tell him to worry about John. The Lord said, you follow me. Now, it's not a matter of what somebody else is blessing, no matter whatever somebody else is doing. Sometimes, First Baptist, I got to always say to you, don't worry about what's going on in the mount. Don't get concerned about what's going on in Calvary. Don't get concerned about what's going on in Grove. You just be concerned about what you're doing. And it's authentic. And it's genuine. And it's about what the Lord wants you to do. But you see, because what God's going to bless that person may not be what God's going to bless me. And how God blesses you, I'm not concerned about. I'm just concerned about how the Lord blesses me. Because your blessing is not mine, and my blessing can't be yours. Sometimes we got to get to the point to realize that we thank God for what somebody else is doing, but you ought to tend to your own business. Matter of fact, when I read that passage of Scripture in several other kinds of versions, it said that the Lord was telling him, mind your business. You see, sometimes you get to the point where you're concerned about what somebody else is doing, even to the point where you're concerned about what that person is doing that's not good. And sometimes then you start talking about, that's why I don't go to church. Because the same people that walk around all holy and act like this and that, they ain't up to nothing and no good. But if I'm concerned about my own soul salvation, I'm not going to worry about what you're doing because I could be doing something a whole lot worse. Sometimes you got to get to the point where you're not talking about everybody else, but you're shouting the Lord's praises. Sometimes you got to get to the place in your life where you're concerned only about minding your own business and doing what the Lord will have you to do. Maybe I'm all by myself on this. Maybe I'm missing the point. But I think it's in the Word. If you really want to follow Him, you've got to make up your mind that that's what you're going to do. Matter of fact, you've got to get to the point where you realize that had it not been for the Lord on your side, where would you be? Oh, I don't get all concerned about what somebody else has and what somebody else is doing. I thank God that He loves me just the way I am. May not be perfect, may not be best, may not be top shelf, but thank God for how he's blessed me. Is there anybody else here that can say that? I'm glad about what the Lord has done for me. Oh, I know one thing. If I don't know nothing else, God will bless you if you serve him. He'll bless you if you trust him. He'll bless you. Is there anybody here that can say, I'm the glad that I made a decision long time ago to love the Lord with all my heart, to trust him with everything I am and I've got. I learned long time ago that there's nobody like this God of ours. And if you go on and tell the world, the world will come to know him as Lord and Savior. Well, I don't know where you are. I don't too sure about sometimes where we are, but I'm glad about one thing. I decided long time ago. I made up my mind long time ago. I made it up even in the month of March when I was just eight years old to go down into a pool at Holy Trinity Baptist Church and tell the Lord, I love you, Lord. I love you because of what you've done for me. Dying on a cross, rising up out of a tomb. You are a good God. You are a loving God. You are a caring God. 
I love the Lord with all of my heart. Is there anybody here that won't say, yes, Lord? I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Is there anybody here want to go with me to my father's house? If you made up your mind that for Christ you live and for Christ you die, have you made up your mind that there's nobody in your life like Jesus? Have you made up your mind that you're for him all the way? Have you made up your mind that you love him with all your heart? Because if you do, he'll bless you. He'll bless you. He'll bless you. And if you love him, you ought to want to serve him. Serve him until you die. Did you have to just have to say that, Pastor? Yes, because the Lord had to tell Peter that as well. You don't know all of the answers that you will receive when you trust the Lord and love the Lord. The things that you have become overwhelmed by in this world, God has the answer to everything. Won't you stand to your feet? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord loves you so much. The Lord wants you to come to know him. Peter had enough sense to be able to say, yes, Lord, you know. But when you made up your mind that you want to serve him, don't let anybody dissuade you. For Christ we live. For Christ we die. You see, one of these days, we shall see our beloved and blessed Savior. And so when you report in, and when you stand before him, the question is, what are you going to be able to say? someone who loves you so much that he gave his life for you. What's going to be your statement to him? Because you want to hear him say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over men. Just to behold his face. Just to know that the God you served and the God you love, the God who's been with you throughout your life, is going to reward you far greater than you've ever been blessed here on this earth. But I would hate for you to miss glory, miss heaven, because you didn't serve him. You didn't do what the Lord would have you to do. And his invitation to you at whatever age, whatever time of your life, is come, follow me. This is a moment for somebody who's never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. 